The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Uh, this is Lee Whitting welcoming you to NDE Radio on this uh, national holiday to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Today I'm avoiding the mention of IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, because I plan to quote Dr. King throughout this program, and that might be construed as both religious and political. IANS is, of course, neither uh, political nor religious in its exploration of near-death experience. I mention this since we had a complaint a few weeks ago concerning an NDE radio speculation I made that fundamentalist Christians might have voted for Trump because of quote, the last Trump, unquote, references in the Bible, that uh, Trump and the last Trump announcing the apocalypse in the Bible might have been taken to be one and the same. So from now on, I will begin with a disclaimer on behalf of IONS whenever I get into things controversial, which is bound to happen from time to time. To quote Dr. King, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. But lest you think today's show has nothing to do with NDEs, let me assure you that that may not be true. In fact, I would like to suggest that there were at least two occasions in his life when Martin Luther King Jr. might have experienced an NDE or OBE. The first was based on an account of a time at the age of 12 when the boy uh, allegedly attempted suicide. According to the story... Uh, King, who was supposed to be home babysitting his six-year-old brother, snuck off to watch a parade. And while he was gone, his brother slid down a banister and accidentally knocked their grandmother unconscious. Though it was an unrelated heart attack that uh, killed the woman, Martin felt so guilty that it was said he attempted suicide by jumping out a second-story window. Martin's father later said the boy was distraught and sleepless for days after. The second possible occasion for an NDE was reported by Dr. King himself in the text of a speech. It seems he was at a book signing when a person King described as a demented black woman came up to him, asked if he was Martin Luther King, and then drove a knife into him a hair's breadth from his aorta. The doctor later said that if uh, King had so much as sneezed, he would have died on the spot. Now, whether or not King had an NDE or OBE that he recalled, I do not know. The only reference we might consider is this. At the conclusion of a speech he gave before he was assassinated, he saw trouble coming and drew a parallel between himself and Moses getting a glimpse from the mountaintop, but not going himself into the promised land. He said he would like to live a long life, but he wasn't concerned about that. He said he just wanted to do God's will. God had allowed him, he said, to go up to the mountain. And he said, quote, and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. Now, I don't doubt Martin was referring to a future when all men and women are treated equally. But doesn't that ring of a possible vision as well that God might have allowed him of the other side as seen in an NDE experience? In any event, he was not afraid to die another characteristic of the nde ear. Primarily, however, I would say the best indication that Dr. King might have experienced an NDE was the emphasis he placed on love, the power of love to overcome hatred, the nature of love being the nature of God, and the only way to heal a broken nation, the only way to heal the racism of his day, which we now see reemerging in America today. Without a doubt, every description of the other side we hear from fellow NDEers is that God, light, and love are one and the same, that the essence of everything is love, that we are deeply and profoundly loved by the light, and that by virtue of being a part of that light, our essence, too, is of love. But just by virtue of our existence on earth, we, we have lost track. We have lost the vision of the healing that can happen when we recognize and practice that uh, that nature to to love, which is the very core of our being. That is the real God particle in us. That is the spark of the divine each of us contains, 
to quote George Fox and the Quakers, the Society of Friends. St. Paul, who wrote about the NDE he experienced when he was stoned nearly to death by an angry mob, had the most profound understanding of love and its power. And he wrote about that in this famous passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which I'm going to read to you. And I think probably you have heard it before one way or another. If I speak in the tongues of mortals of, and of angels, but do not have love, I am just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Just noise. And if I have prophetic powers, uh, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. And I'm going to talk a little about the difference between love and faith in a minute, because it's it's really, uh, as I thought about this passage and talking about this program and, and what it uh, might mean for our country today, uh, where we go with love and with faith uh, might be two entirely different directions. I call this a famous passage um, because most or all of 1 Corinthians 13 is used in many Christian wedding ceremonies, and so even non-churchgoers have heard it read from time to time. I, I often cringe when I come to that passage, love never ends, because what, some 50% of marriages do and people suffer the loss of love in marriages uh, from time to time, even if they don't get divorced. The love that this passage talks about is God. God and love never end. What we reference as love in marriage is, uh, is one thing, but the love re- referenced in this passage is far more profound. And St. Paul saw it. And Martin Luther King did as well. Why does St. Paul compare faith, hope, and love and, and, and actually rank love above the other two? Well, simply put, because hope implies the possibility of doubt. Uh, it's the way of overcoming doubt. Faith implies the focusing of the mind. Faith and hope, by the way, are emphasized uh, more fully, I think, by Christian churches than is love. Unfortunately, I would say, I would add to that. Churches excel in providing hope and in developing and nurturing faith. But it's the rare church that makes love its primary goal. In some ways, faith and love are contradictory, or at times can work against one another. So let's uh, take for a moment the notion of a faith that can move mountains. Well, how do you get to the point where your faith could move a mountain? And frankly, the, the next question that follows is, why would you want to? Interestingly, there, there's a famous missing verse in some Bibles in the book of Matthew. Um, it's found or not found 
in Matthew chapter 17, and it would be verse 21 if it were there. And in some Bibles it is. I believe it is in the King James. You should check your own Bible and see if it's there. That's Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. It happens where Jesus' disciples come and ask why they hadn't had the power to cast out some demons. And Jesus answers, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. When I first heard that passage, I thought, well, you know, you plant a mustard seed and a tree grows. It's astounding how how it can survive and move things out of its way when it needs to. But that's not really what Jesus was saying. He was talking about faith to really move mountains. But then there comes the missing verse, this verse 21. Missing, as I say, from many editions of the Bible. It reads, but this kind of faith never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting implies a motivation, a a drive, a kind of desire, the desire for a a kind of self-aggrandizing faith that could literally move mountains, that could lead us um, away from love, even while we are sitting in our church pew thinking about God. And it's not only Christians, of course, who can succumb to such temptations. There are some Buddhist monks, for instance, who have developed amazing abilities uh, over their own bodies, over their environment, and so forth. Um, by deep meditation, they have learned to sit naked in mountain snow and generate enough heat to warm themselves and even warm others standing nearby. Some monks have taught themselves through fasting and meditative prayer to control their bodies to slow so thoroughly that they can be buried for days at a time. Their disciples will put them in a box, put them in in a grave so that there's no oxygen getting to them, and they will be dug up days later and they will not have suffocated. They've developed that kind of powerful control over their over their own human body. So do we want to have extraordinary power over our bodies or extraordinary power over the rest of the creation like God, moving mountains? Or do we want to love the creation like God loves us? The two between the, the difference between these two, faith and love, are not only different, they can be terribly at odds with each other. Paul understood this. And Martin Luther King did as well. Unfortunately, many of uh, today's Christians and others have opted for faith power instead of the power of love. And given our technological control over the physical world these days, blind faith, faith in ourselves and our role in the world and our position of authority, this blind faith in ourselves to make the right decisions uh, in many cases, seems to be going horribly wrong. It all seems particularly true right now as we see the new administration coming into power. And on this day, uh, set aside to, uh, to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, I, I got to thinking, well, I wonder what Dr. King would say today to the reoccurrence of um, racism and bigotry, uh, the... Um, the, the kinds of people who being who are now being appointed to uh, cabinet offices who are opposed to the uh, investing more funds in the public school system who are trying to um, uh, diminish the amount of money that goes into um, Medicare and Medicaid social security and the social safety nets generally um, what would uh, Dr. King have to say to his old enemies, and the old enemies, I should say, of greed and racism and prejudice and religious bigotry and hatred and the threat of unbridled political power and the muffling of uh, free the free press and the manipulation of spy agencies of the government that um, he was up against himself uh, half a century ago when uh, J. Edgar Hoover was... Uh, 
in hot pursuit of him and who may even have engineered his assassination. And these uh, same forces uh, we see emerging again today. Anyway, trying to put that picture together, I uh, went and looked up some of the quotes attributed to, to, to Dr. King and thought of how and to whom they might be directed if King were with us today. First, as a general statement to Muslims and Christians both, King might have repeated his observation that, quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And as an addendum, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. And to the recurrence of bigotry in America, and we see it, uh, it, it came up over and over again during and even after uh, this recent election. Slogans of hatred painted on synagogues and on mosques, uh, women wearing the traditional uh, Muslim uh, outfit being uh, harassed, and having their head coverings pulled off and uh, mosques uh, actually physically attacked and, and attempted fires and the like. To that, King might have said in the end, this is a quote from him, in the end we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Because, of course, we, by not actively participating in the uh, uh, pro- you know, in the protest of these um, these awful acts, uh, well, we're the we're the silent friends that um, that he was talking to. And here's a quote from Martin that would have been appropriate to uh, Nazi Germany, to Assad Syria, to Putin's Russia, or to any authoritarian regime. It's uh, Dr. King said, "Quote: There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because." Conscience tells him it is right. End quote. And also, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. End quote. And also, and this is a brief but a powerful, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. To address some of these two uh, new appointees, to the new appointee is Secretary of the Department of Education, who has spent much of her professional life in opposition to public school education and to public school funding, and uh, is emphasizing the development of private, for-profit charter schools, Dr. King might have said intelligence plus character. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education, as opposed to uh, segregation and profit. Intelligence plus character. And to the new appointee is Attorney General Sessions, who was opposed to equal voting rights for all American citizens, even in Martin Luther King's time. And remains so today, it was quoted as saying when the Supreme Court dismantled the Voting Rights Act, this is a wonderful day for the South. King might have said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And also, never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. And also, we must live together as brothers or perish together as fools. And to the cabinet appointees who do not accept climate change and environmental pollution as an immediate threat to our survival, King might have used this quote, science investigates, religion interprets, science gives man knowledge, which is power, religion gives man wisdom, which is control, science deals mainly with facts, religion deals mainly with values, the two are not rivals. And to President Trump, 
those who are not looking for happiness, not looking for happiness, are the most likely to find it because those who are searching for happiness forget that the surest way to be happy is to seek happiness for others. And then to all of us, King said in a speech, now there is a final reason I think that Jesus says love your enemies. It is this, that love has within it a redemptive power. And there is a power there that eventually transforms individuals. Just keep being friendly to that person. Just keep loving them, and they can't stand it too long. No, they react in many ways in the beginning. They react with guilt feelings, and sometimes they'll hate you a little more at that transition period. But just keep loving them, and by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. That's love, you see. It's redemptive. And this is why Jesus says love. There's something about love that builds up and is creative. There's something about hate that tears down and is destructive. So love your enemies. On the 4th of July, 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a sermon at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, on the wisdom and universality of the Declaration of Independence I can't read the sermon to you for copyright reasons, but let me remind you of the basic premise by reading a portion of the Declaration itself. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. In other words, we get we can get real comfortable with these things over a long period of time. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations uh, pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. King was struck by the universality of the two centuries old document. Declaration of Independence, and he built the the speech at uh, Ebenezer Baptist around this document. And uh, like all his speeches, it was a very powerful uh, presentation. He pointed out, Declaration, it doesn't say some men. It says all men. It doesn't say all white men. It says all men, which includes black men. It does not say all Gentiles. It says all men, which includes Jews. It doesn't say all Protestants. It says all men, which includes Catholics. It doesn't even say all theists and believers. It says all men, which includes humanists and agnostics. End quote. And I should add to that, of course, that back when he was writing, men meant mankind men and women both. It seems shocking to me. Someone who lived through Martin Luther King's time and marched in the streets of New York and Washington, that we should today find ourselves thrown back to that same era of restricting voter rights, harassing people of other faiths and colors, and looking to an authoritarian form of government run by and for corporate interests 
and holding power by bullying the press and promising to enforce laws favoring popular prejudices, ignorance, and hatred. There were other quotes from that same speech at Ebenezer Baptist, which seem painfully appropriate to today. Quotes such as, quote, the price that America must pay for the continued suppression of the Negro and other minority groups is the price of its own destruction. For the hour is late and the clock of destiny is ticking out. King also said the phrase, all men are created equal, means every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him a uniqueness. It gives him worth. It gives him dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. King even had a, uh, some words for today's one percenters, the, the wealthy class. <clears throat> he said, quote, a class system can be as vicious and as evil as a system based on racial prejudice. And that's why we must join the war against poverty and believe in the dignity of all work. King said, I'm tired of this stuff about menial labor. What makes it menial is that we don't pay folk anything. Give somebody a job and pay them some money so they can live and educate their children and buy a home and have the basic necessities of life. And no matter what the job is, it takes on dignity. Of course, King was uh, also a realist. He said, history is the long story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges without strong resistance. They seldom do it voluntarily. And so if the American dream is to be a reality... We must work to make it a reality and realize the urgency of the moment. But as always, King came back to love, the topic of love. He said, quote, oh yes, love is the way. Love is the only absolute. More and more I see this. I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. Hate is too great a burden to bear. I've seen it on the faces of too many sheriffs in the South. I've seen hate. I've seen hate in the faces and even the walk of too many Klansmen of the South. I've seen hate. Hate distorts the personality. Hate does something to the soul that causes one to lose its objectivity. The man who hates can't think straight. The man who hates can't reason right. The man who hates can't see right. The man who hates can't walk right. And I know that Jesus is right, that love is the way. And this is why John said, quote, God is love, so that he who hates does not know God, but he who loves at that moment has the key that opens the door to the meaning of ultimate reality. Just some of the words of Martin Luther King, Jr., did he learn these truths through an NDE? Well, I guess we'll have to ask him when we get over there. If you'd like to listen again to this or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org and tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.